Hey everyone, welcome back to Crown Corner, the channel where we dive into the wild world of entitled people and their unbelievable stories. Hope you enjoy it. And without further ado, let's go. Woke up to four sick kids. So I do as any responsible parent and keep them home from school and give a Yorkie. Poo a heads up, I won't be coming in. Now, I know that calling in on a Monday after the holiday weekend is a huge no, no, so I'm already stressed, you know. But they can suck it because I'll do whatever is in the best interest of my children. Which lead me to going to the store. I started to feel ill and wanted to get to Kroger before it all hit me. My wife stayed back with the kids. She wasn't feeling well either. So I run to the store. I grab some popsicles, Gatorade, act for some feverish kids. Then I head over to medication area to get some chest rub and those shower crystals to help you breathe in the shower. Some lady is in front of me the whole way there. She's knocking stuff off the shelves and then stopping everyone because you can't get around her while she picks it up. And the whole time she's mumbling to herself about how people will just have to wait and she's sorry, but it's just how it is, yada, 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 yada. I decide to go the opposite way around the store to avoid her. I found what I needed on the bottom shelf. I'm really tall. I don't like to bend all the way down there. I take a knee. I'm looking and comparing prices when I hear where is. I ignore it as background noise, but then this lady, the same one inconveniencing everyone from earlier, gets right up close to me. And then she has the audacity to say, you're on the floor. You must work here. Where is? Blah, 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 after that. So I grabbed the things I wanted and she asked again, do you know where? And I stood up, looked her dead in the eyes and as firm as possible without being rude said no. I didn't offer any follow-up after my one-word answer. I thought that should have been efficient to get the point across. But it wasn't enough for this lady. She went on to insist I work there and should know where the thing is. That's when I turned on aggravated beyond all recognition parenting mode. And I realized at this point, this lady would just not get it. So I leaned down, and I looked her in the eyes again and said, What makes you think I work here? Do I have a name tag? Do I have a uniform? Did I answer your questions and offer any help? And the she says she didn't mean to insult me. So I told her she's very insulting, and I don't even work here. Imagine how insulted the actual employees would feel to be approached like that. And then I walked away. Edit. I have gotten some good feedback. However, I have decided I'm going to take a new approach to this kind of situation. Next time, I'm going to tell them they should know where it is, because they manage the place. Then I'll proceed to whine about another imaginary employee. And I might just ask them for a raise, for always going above and beyond. Then maybe, just maybe, if I see an unhappy customer, I'll direct them to the manager I just appointed, to make any complaints. This was back in the early 2000s, probably 2003-2004 school year. Throughout the entire year, there was a crime wave of people having things stolen out of their locked lockers. Not everyone, but enough that everyone knew someone it happened to. The school's only defense about this was that it was our fault for sharing locker combos with our friends. They also charged us every time we had to get the combination changed on a locker, like after a theft, for instance, because it was assumed to be our fault. Well, I had my graphing calculator taken out of my locker. I also never gave out my combination to anyone. Mostly because my friends were jerks and we pulled pranks on each other all the time. So I was out $150 for the calculator and another $150 to change the combination, getting a locksmith to change out the lock. This is 2003 money, so it's a bit more than now. To anyone who has ever had to buy a TIE 86 in 2003 or 2004, you'll know how much the things cost. Well, my dad was buddies with one of the county detectives. I'll call him Detective Buddy and or Uncle Buddy. He went in to talk to the school about these string of thefts going on so he could get the security camera for the day my calculator went missing and got completely brushed off as it was a non-existent problem and he must have given out his locker combination. The principal told him he would need a warrant to get the camera footage. Then when he got the warrant, the school fought the warrant in court citing student privacy. Cue the pro-revenge, Detective Buddy shows up at our house with a laptop and a laptop bag. He's like, throw this in your locker and tell everyone you know about your brand new laptop. Oh, okay. Sure, Uncle Buddy. 
Three days later, I show up at my locker between classes and the laptop is gone, the bag to nowhere to be seen, as is a 24-ounce bottle of Coke, and possibly some pen. I take my phone out and text him that the laptop got taken. Stand by for the heck show. Oh, and you reported the theft to the police fee, he replies back. Okay, I reply, confused. I got about the rest of my day and I didn't hear anything back. The following morning, Detective Buddy comes to the school with three uniformed officers and pulls a student, Dave, out of class as well as his mom who works in the front office. The principal is angry. I don't actually hear the cops, but the principal is mad to no end that he had the audacity to accuse them of theft and he couldn't just take them out of his school, etc., etc. Well, it turns out there was a tracker in the laptop bag, and Uncle Buddy got a warrant to search a particular house. The laptop had a value of over $1,000, making it a felony. The next afternoon, he set up a tent with a table just outside of school grounds. He also had a banner across the top, if you have had something stolen from your locker, see me. By the next morning, Dave and his mom made the paper. Apparently, Dave allegedly used his mom's login information to get onto the school network and get the locker combinations for basically everyone. Then he just opened random lockers looking for valuables to steal, if he didn't get info of a specific locker to steal from. When he set up the stand to get more people reporting thefts, he racked up a crazy number of charges. Each locker counted as a separate misdemeanor unless the stolen object was worth more than $1,000, in which case it was a felony. In less than a week, Uncle Buddy opened and broke an investigation, and they charged Dave and his mom with nine felonies and 35 misdemeanor charges. When I finally got the story from Buddy, he explained what the situation was. He had me stash a brand new laptop that had a GP's tracking unit stuck in it in my locker, then got it stolen deliberately, and then he got a warrant to search the property it had been taken to. Now, the fun thing to stress is that the laptop was over $1,000 worth, pushing the theft from a misdemeanor and into felony level. There were also another eight felony charges, stuff like jewelry that was stolen from other people's locker and recovered. So any of the locker break-ins that amounted to over $1,000 stolen was a felony charge, and less than $1,000 was a misdemeanor charge. The cool thing was that because the calculator and the laptop were separate days, and the combination changed between the days, he caught a felony and a misdemeanor charge off me alone. The nine felony thefts ended up in the $12,000 range total, and the 35 misdemeanor charges were somewhere in the range of $3,000 total in value. Now that's an awful lot of stuff stolen, but I need to stress that this is only what was proven stolen. Like this is what they caught him with in his possession that they could trace back to someone. They also didn't let them plead to anything. It was Podunkville's highest profile crime in years, and without a doubt, one of the worst crime sprees the county had seen in decades. Next up, on the revenge. Everyone who had been charged $150 to get their locker combinations changed sued the school district in a class action lawsuit. The justification was that the school did nothing to investigate the 44 proven, and more than likely 200 cases of locker theft, and then charge money to get the locker combinations changed. There were 218 people in the class, and in total everyone got $85 after attorney's fees. The principal also lost his job for being a bonehead and not bothering to attempt to deal with the massive problem that was reported to him going on at the school. The fun thing I need to point out is that the school brought in a locksmith to change out the locks. That's why they justified charging $150. Well, the school already paid the $150 a locker, but they also had to return $100 per locker, meaning that they were out $21,800 plus their legal fees for that class action suit. Next comes the criminal trial and the fallout. The prosecutor's deal was 10 years in prison, 5 in juvie and 5 in adult prison, for Dave and 15, for Dave's mom. Well, they refused that deal, and it went to trial. Dave got one year prison for each felony, the state minimum, and one month probation for each misdemeanor. So nine years plus 35 months of probation. His mom received 18 years of jail and six years probation. Having attended much of the best parts of the trial, I will say this. They had Dave on camera entering 20 lockers, and they had them in possession of stolen goods for every single charge they made against them. The judge was also not amused that there were likely other reported crimes that they got away with because they couldn't prove it or they weren't reported. Dave's mom got it worse. That was a fun sentencing show up for. 
But the most important thing is that I got my graphing calculator back. It had my name engraved inside the battery compartment. I still have it as well as a cool story to tell. I am a real estate agent in the Pacific Northwest. Inventory of homes for sale throughout the region are historically low, and demand is especially high creating a perfect storm for buyers, forcing them to compete for every sale. It is extremely difficult emotionally for buyers and creates a lot more work for us as agents for several reasons. The first is that home values are so high people from all walks of life decide to become licensed agents, and currently we have more agents in our market than homes sold. That means we have a lot of inexperienced agents listing homes at prices that don't make sense, so we have to do a ton of work for each offer, written to ensure our clients don't overpay for a property. Also knowing that the likelihood for that offer to be accepted is super low when there will be 510, sometimes as many as 20 offers on one home. Also, with having to compete against a ton of other buyers, buyers are offering to purchase homes with little to no negotiations for inspections, let alone repairs. This puts an even higher burden on us agents to try to look at home as critically as possible to try to catch costly repairs before our clients commit to purchasing. I woke up one morning with a text from a buyer expressing interest in a home that just popped up for sale. After looking at the details, I realized the home was perfect for the two of them. The listing picks were of a home that was nicely remodeled in the area of town they wanted to live in, and at a price that was right in line with their budget. The private notes from the seller's agent to the buyer's agents on the listing said the seller would review offers four days in the future and to submit your highest and best offer by 5 p.m. on the deadline date. I reached out to the listing agent to chat about the home to schedule a show-in. The agent was new. This was their first listing, and they also worked mainly in a city 40 miles away. The listing advertised a full remodel and incredibly low property taxes. Those are red flags, one and two, for non-permitted work. After scheduling the showing for the following day, when my clients were off work, I set to work determining a fair price per square foot and to verify the permit status of the recently finished remodel. First, I determined the home was underpriced by about $100. Any offer we would be making would have to be at a minimum $100 above what they were listing at. There are no deals in our market. An underpriced home will just get a ton more offers. No one is paying list price for an underpriced home. Second, I compared the home to the tax records and the listing picks from the last time it was sold. The seller was an investor that owned the home for less than a year. Well, wouldn't you know it, the home went from 1,300 square foot, two-bedroom, one-bathroom, to 1,800 square foot, three-bedroom, two-bathroom home, with no permits on file from the city. This was an illegal flip. No permits pulled, no guarantees the work was done by professionals, no inspections to ensure the wiring was safe or the plumbing wasn't leaking, and no records with the taxing authority. This means that once the home is sold to the new owners, the city could fine them every day for non-permitted work until the work was inspected, retroactively permitted if even possible, and the county could sue the new owners for up to six years back taxes for omitted property. This means that the buyer wouldn't have the state-mandated warranty from a licensed contractor. There was no bonding or insurance to collect if the work wasn't done in a professional manner. This could ruin a buyer if they weren't sufficiently capitalized. The flipper would profit, and profit mightily, by taking advantage of seller's market and unsuspecting buyers. While I was doing my due diligence, I was shocked to see the home went sale pending less than two hours after I first spoke to the listing agent. They didn't tell me an offer was received when I asked, and they ignored the offer deadline that they themselves set. The agent said the sellers received an offer they couldn't refuse. I then had to tell my rightfully frustrated clients that we missed the boat. They didn't even get a chance to see it in person. Here's the petty revenge. I collected all the information the listing agent provided, including the photos of the home, saved them as a PDF, and submitted them to our city's code enforcement department. Then I set the home on a watch list and waited to see what would happen. And waited, waited. Knowing full well, I pulled the pin on a grenade and hoped it was thrown in time to blow up before ownership was transferred. Ten days, twenty days go by and I hear nothing. By the twenty-fifth day, I'm starting to worry. A sale contract typically only takes thirty days to finish. Then, literally on the thirtieth day, I see the city has officially launched an investigation and a certified letter went out to the owners. 
and the sale hadn't finished yet. Just in time. Then the sale doesn't close. 35 days, 40 days, and nothing. On the 50th day, the deed is recorded and the sale finishes. The deed contained all the usual language, except that the previous owner was made responsible to pay for all fees, penalties, and fines issued by the city and the county for ongoing issues relating to the non-permitted work and the subsequent tax increases they would have had to pay had they gotten permits in the first place. The buyer received the home with assurances that they wouldn't be on the hook for the previous owner's negligence. For me, it was sweet revenge knowing that the seller was held accountable to ensure they sold a home that was safe to live in. I had my first encounter with an entitled mother today. Off to the mall for a pair of winter shoes so I don't slush my dang socks. Lucky me, a spot really close to the entrance is open. As I'm creeping up to the spot, there's a woman with a baby strapped to her chest and someone I assume is a sister friend, whatever, walking up the laneway. They looked like they were just going in the mall, but then they stood in the spot I was trying to pull into. Sensational. I waved. They ignored me. I tapped my horn and they waved me off saying that they're saving that spot for their friend. I pretty much told them that that isn't how a parking lot works and that I'm not moving. Entitled mom then looks at me and starts going on about how she has a baby and that she should get to park closer to the mall because of her baby. Ero, ero. I tell her I don't care about her baby. Back and forth with her insisting that she won't move and for some dumb reason starts going on about I dare you to hit me. Like, dude, I'm not insane and you were just going on about your baby. Since she wouldn't move, I just laid on the horn until this big red truck that had a guy they were with started to come up behind me. Lo and behold, there was an open space literally only two spaces down that the red truck pulled into. Meanwhile, the mom and the other woman she was with to walk out of the space, calling me every name in the book. Which, C-word, W-word, I can't believe I made a new mother move. Honestly, it felt like a YouTube rage bait video. I'm staying in my car because I genuinely don't trust crazy people not to do crazy things to my car. The guy who was driving their truck just looked down at his phone while the women told me off for endangering their baby as they all walked past to go inside. Honestly, I like to think he was embarrassed. It what makes people think that one. I care about your kids, and two, that you can stand in parking spaces to claim dibs. Enjoying the stories yet? If you do, please subscribe, like, and comment. Back during the 90s in the UK, when you're in your final years of secondary education, or you could call it your GCSE years, the, the schools did something called workplace experience. This was basically where you find a job where you spend two weeks experiencing work after you leave school. Even then, I found it pointless for many reasons. In my case, I couldn't find a job that would accept me, so the school went looking and found one for me. To make note, I wasn't the only one the school had to help on this. Well, the school found me a placement at, in the office at a dedicated mechanics education school. Basically, it was a mechanic shop like any other, but where the mechanics working on your car van are students training for their mechanics qualifications. While I was there, I wasn't allowed to do much. Like they didn't want me there at all, so I would give a menial task. Deliver documents to offices next door. Fetch coffee. Use the franking machine. And other stuff. It was like they just volunteered me to do stuff they didn't want me to do. However, when it came down to it, it was mostly simple, easy jobs. Apart from fetching coffee from the staff kitchen, they had this little room which was called a mail room. It wasn't big. I could stand in the middle of the room and touch all four walls. There was a desk attached to the wall and a shelf above it with a bunch of mailing bags. The usual stuff you'd find in a mail room of an office. In this case, there was franking machine in the middle of the desk with two baskets to one side used for placing mail ready for franking. One for first class postage and the other for second class. For those not in the know as to what a franking machine is, you'd have better luck looking them up, but I'll give you the footnote. When you get mail and you see in the top right printed markings instead of a postage stamp, that is where the franking machine comes in. Businesses can go to Royal Mail and bulk buy postage or whatever. I'm not exactly sure how it works. 
The franking machines print those postage details onto the envelopes instead of a person going through the hassle of removing postage stamps from the stamp books and making sure to stick it in the correct place on the envelope. With the machine, the job is done quickly. So down to the malicious compliance. As you have figured out, this compliance is with the franking machine. I was taught how to use the machine. It was already pre-programmed what to print. All I had to do was select whether to print first or second class postage. Then I would slot an envelope into one side like I was swiping a bank card to pay for groceries. After the envelope enters the machine by a certain amount, the machine activates and pulls the envelope through. I soon found out that this machine had a temper. Sometimes it would take its time pulling the envelopes through, other times it'd yank the envelope out of your hand and shoot it against the wall. Surprisingly, with an intact, properly printed Frank Mark, one day, I was told, go do the mail, and so I did. I slotted an envelope into the machine, and it did its usual. However, with one new result, it had sliced open the envelope. As in, you can remove the letters, etc. From inside the envelope, like someone had just opened their mail with one of those letter opener knives. I grabbed the envelope and went to my boss. The following conversation isn't Zach, but you get the idea. Boss, what do you want? Surely you haven't finished with the mail already. Me, no, I've barely started. Boss, then go and finish it. Me, I can't, there's a problem with the franking machine. Boss, there's always a problem with it. Just go back and finish posting the mail. Me, but it's slicing the envelopes open. I tried to show her the sliced envelope. Boss, ignoring the envelope, she said, just frank the mail, will you? Or is that too difficult of a job for someone learning how businesses work? Me. Okay, but it's not my fault if something bad happens. I turn and return to the mailroom. Along the way, I grabbed some paper and wrote on it that I apologize for the damaged envelopes, that the machine was slicing them open, and that my boss refused to listen to me about it. Then I proceeded to put envelope after envelope through the machine. Everyone came out sliced open. I must have done a couple hundred of them for first class alone. Once done, I didn't put them in mailbags. I just neatly piled them at the side of the machine with a letter on top. About half an hour before the end of my shift, someone came into the office carrying several of the envelopes and my letter. I quickly found out that he was the boss of the business. As in the highest position, he'd apparently stepped into the mailroom with a few of his own letters for franking and found the pile. After arguing with my boss and me being blamed for it like I was snooping into every envelope to see what I could find, so I volunteered to show what was happening. My boss and her boss grudgingly accepted my offer, so I grabbed a sheet of plain paper from the nearest fax machine and a fresh envelope. Putting the paper in the envelope, I asked Big Boss to seal it as confirmation that it's sealed. I then led them both to the mail room, at arm's length so they can both watch me. I gently slotted it into the machine until the machine took over. Sure enough, the machine coughed out a freshly sliced envelope. Then my boss tried telling me off for not telling her, only for me to say that I tried, but she refused to listen. I only did what I was told. I was let off in the end. The next day, the machine was unplugged, so nothing was getting posted. The day after that, there were a couple of piles of postage stamp books, which of course I had to stick on the envelopes. When I returned for my second week there, I was shown how to use a brand new machine. This new machine was a dream. Just imagine you had spent 10 years driving the same car until it was falling apart, and then you finally upgraded to a new car that is so new, the mileage on it was still double digits. Until I left that place, I was still given menial tasks, but my boss never ignored me again. A few years after leaving school, that business closed up shop. The building then got taken over by a big brand tire company that also did MOTs, alignments, etc. Trigger warning. Verbal, emotional, and physical abuse. Essay mentions drug abuse and suicide. First, I F41. I want to say my mom, F63, is ambitious, has her own business, and at some point had two day and evening businesses. She works hard and was our main breadwinner when I was growing up. Lived also with dad, grandma, and brother. I never really had emotional connection with my mother. I always longed for one. I feel like I should come to terms that I will have the bare minimum of it. I think she is emotionally immature. 
Most of her life has had anger issues, smokes cigarettes, literally. Non-stop and drinks every day, sometimes starting at lunch. I don't think she's an alcoholic, but I might be wrong. It's kind of socially acceptable to drink every day where I'm from originally. A few years ago, she sold our apartment to pay off her second business debts and didn't tell me for two, three years at least, thinking I might not want to visit, maybe. She said she also doesn't know why she kept that information. She admitted that first business is good, but uses money to cover for second businesses and eventually shut it down, but still lives in the huge building hotel with the restaurant and is trying to sell it. She said we might be paying debts after she dies, but I said no way I will pay ever for anything when I'm a stay-at-home mom working barely part-time from home. She had asked me to move back and be the manager for said business when it was open, but I refused right away because I knew in two weeks we will be arguing if something isn't her way. Plus, I was right to guess it wouldn't be successful for long. She forced my brother to work weekends there for years, and he had to travel so much and not spend time with his GF. Currently has one loan and insurance on it if she passes. She hints to help us if she sells the building, and I realize I don't want her to think she can pay off our or part of our mortgage and move in. She asked how much is to rent a place near me. Think tourist area. I said a lot. I have offered her to come maximum six months here and six months in Eastern Europe, basically close to my brother, to buy with the money an apartment closer to him or a house to do her favorite thing, gardening. She starts crying that she's going to be alone. I said, we'll meet someone, and she doesn't want a man to have her as a maid again, traditional gender bias in said country. She longs to see grandkids and participate in parties, and when she comes and I take her to said parties, she is not happy because she doesn't speak the language. I don't know what to do to help her be happy. I also tried clearing the past with her and asked her to apologize for some things, but in her mind she was never wrong and makes fun of me saying that I feel traumatized. Some examples of that are, I was regularly beaten as a kid, slapped as a teen. Yelled at every day, even for getting a B at school. I was a good kid. Yells to me about the smallest things in every setting and in front of anyone. I guess my dad had a pill addiction and drank a lot and killed himself, but I doubt it was only him at fault. She was yelling constantly to him and alienating him from his family, so I think maybe he couldn't take it. No one let me see the death note he left. I was only told he loved us and had mental illness. Gives me a gift of cleaning my yard and buying some plants, but won't stop and makes bigger and bigger plans and wants to rearrange my furniture while visiting. Complains about my lifestyle and my brothers and how I raise my kids and how he has no kids. Talks against family members for no real reason and alienates me subconsciously from them, sometimes for years. She was mocking my appearance like saying I had big nose, big ears, hanging butt, and if we both lost weight, mine would still hang like my dad's and hers won't. Didn't let me work until 20 years old because I wanted to save and buy clothes I actually liked. I was late home once as a teenager and it was because of a sap. She called me a W word and kicked me out for a bit. Oh, yeah, and ripped my new clothes only hoodie. I actually liked and got to choose. She tended to rip and cut people's clothes if she was mad at them. When she's over, if I ask her to watch the kids, she literally sits down and watches them. Usually only calls online to see them, not me. Comes to visit grandkids and tells me to hit them, which pissed me off, and told her everything I wanted her to apologize for. But she never thinks she is wrong and told me to be thankful I was born. Forced me to not study art and do economy in high school and college, so I barely graduated college because I really wanted to study something else. I admit she did support me financially until 2021, but I wish I could work earlier. I finally thought myself some art and use it in my current home part-time job, soon to be full-time job. Before I had kids, I had good career, but now hubby does most work outside. When I started my business, my mom at first mocked me and yelled at me that it what I'm doing, but now seems proud. She only ever showed any respect to me after my business started. My husband likes her, does everything she wants. My friend loves her, and I can't help but feel I am an ungrateful. They both said everything she did, including physical abuse, made me the strong, successful person I am now. Like what? I plan to raise my kids better. And hopefully she and my husband don't guilt me to have her live here. I really tried to get away all these years. Please tell me the truth. Am I obligated to something or am I being ungrateful? A childhood friend that was the most empathetic, kind guy I've ever known did a hitch in the Navy, went into computers and played guitar in a band, married a pretty mean girl that liked the idea of a big wedding and musician husband, but had no interest in a marriage. 
She was her family's golden child, drop-dead gorgeous, and completely narcissistic spoil. They buy land. He borrows money and has his family build their house to reduce costs. He was paying them back over time while she spent money and socialized, sometimes working a part-time job. Inside of two years, she's bored and starts an affair, or we think never stopped affairs, but gets caught and while the empathetic guy tries to work things out, she makes false accusations of domestic abuse and files for divorce, with restraining order keeping him out of the home he and his family, built with their own hands. Now keep in mind he's still paying his family back for the home, still ordered to pay for the land, and most of the upkeep maintenance. He's back in his childhood bedroom while his wife entertains her men in that house. With some research by the lawyer, the family still technically own the house. Now, my family owns a heavy equipment business, including house structural movers. Look up house movers to verify what I said. When she went on vacation with her family and new boyfriend, we went in, jacked up the house, and drove off with it, repossessed. The structure wasn't covered in the court order, just the mortgage land. She had legal claim to the land. Her name was on the mortgage, but the structure appeared nowhere on the deed and there was still money owed on most of the materials labor, so it was simply reposted. Now, the judge wasn't happy at all, but it wasn't illegal to repossess, since the land mortgage was the only thing he was court-ordered to pay. She came home to foundation, pipesy wires sticking out of the ground, and a crappy used yard barn with her personal possessions in it. Now, it wouldn't be nuclear if it stopped there. Since the main character has recently passed away, I can tell more. We had a guy we called Big Bob and named Fitz. Everyone probably knows someone that defies jail, death, is a walking demolition crew, and in fact we called him Demolition Man for a while after the movie. Apparently, someone put huge dildos smeared with dried whipped cream crust in her possessions found when her dad and friends came to get the rest of her possessions out of the yard barn. There were also extreme insertion, porn and bestiality porn magazines, bongs shaped like penis, etc. Someone used her pictures in the dating magazines, pre-internet, for a paid escort with her phone number. Her parents even had to change their phone numbers a few times. Someone got those change of address cards from the post office and sent her mail around the country. Someone knew exactly when the legal separation happened and she was supposed to get her own car insurance, but she didn't get that letter. Her car burned down in her workplace parking lot a few days after the legal separation happened and, of course, she didn't get the insurance company notification in the mail, so no insurance. Someone had intimate pictures printed, man's face blacked out on flyers. The printing pointed out that wasn't her husband at the time and stuck them under windshield wipers at her family's church, every place she worked, all around her neighborhood. Cops got involved in that, but they couldn't find where the flyers were printed. Big Bob was an over-the-road truck driver. Everything died down when she finally agreed to let our friend buy her out on the land for a reasonable sum, paying for it twice, and drop the restraining order. Less than a week after he had clear title, the house showed back up right where it was before. Since it was still on the steel used to move it, all we had to do was stick a truck back under it and take it back, hook it up. This was until she decided to marry a guy from a hard-working family that were doing well. She loved Bomb, the poor, hard-working sap. He never knew what hit him. She had a bachelorette party with her pretty mean girlfriends at a local recreation lake and rubbed it in her bachelorette party. It was going to cost more, be better than her wedding to my friend. I think that's what cued the nuclear revenge. The flyers showed up all over at his bachelor party, at his parents' house with his family, and her bachelorette party got busted for drugs where they found several people in various stages of undress, including the bride-to-be and quite a bit of drugs, bunches of alcohol, etc. When that wedding blew up, the wedding dress from the first marriage to our friend showed up on a scarecrow with a pentagram on the front, what looked like blood paint, on it in her front yard. No one even missed the wedding dress from the first wedding until then. Every workplace, every time she dated someone seriously, etc., the flyers showed back up. She finally gained about 50, 70 pounds and quit trying to date seriously. She looked like her 70-pound overweight mother, but 30 years earlier. She married a fat truck driver eventually. Rip Big Bob, you were one hell of a friend and we are all going to miss you. We will sing the song of your people and raise a glass to you every time we meet. Things have been going smoothly. I'm doing well in school, taking some extracurriculars, robotics and debate team, and still have time to read and hang out with friends. I've started to communicate with my dad, my decision. 
never in person, just over the phone. Mostly it's small talk. I talk about school and classes, and he gives me updates on Matt's, my little brother. I've not said a word to my mother directly since the day custody was given to my grandmother. The last time we spoke, my dad told me that Matt had realized I was no longer around and became more agitated. They hired a nanny to help out, but both my parents were still forced to cut back their hours. That was a week and a half ago. This past Saturday, I had my dream birthday party, which was themed after books. My birthday cake looked like a stack of books. Snacks were themed after literary genres, and everyone came dressed as book characters. I dressed as Sherlock Holmes, We had a very cozy venue all to ourselves, and it was great. It was a very chill, relaxed party. My grandmother hired security for the party with a strict list of who was allowed. This was due to a couple of bullies at school who heard about my party and threatened to crash it. The party ended after a few hours, and most of the guests left. The ones left were my grandmother, myself, one of the guards, and my two closest friends. I excused myself to go to the restroom, and when I came out, one of my friends met me halfway down the hall. She tried to push me back into the restroom, saying my mother had shown up and was demanding to see me. I told nobody from my family about this party, not my dad, not even the family members who supported me because of this exact possibility. I also didn't post about it on social media. I heard yelling from my grandmother and decided to confront the situation myself. The security guard was holding my mom back and my grandmother was livid. The second my mother saw me, she became irate screaming that I was a disgrace, that she was never going to let me just cut her off, and if I knew what was good for me, I'd come home. I didn't feel scared or even angry. I was just tired. I kind of sighed, pulled out my phone, and told her I would call in the police. It was up to her if she stayed to face them, but either way I was filing a no-contact order. She went pale, screamed at me one last time, then ran off, getting into her car and speeding away. I was glad it didn't happen during the party, but it left me shaken. Needless to say, my grandmother and I will be speaking to our attorney tomorrow. I'm still not sure how she found out about the party, which is what spooks me the most. Do entitled narcissistic parents just have some ability that lets them repeatedly attempt to screw up their kids' lives? I'm starting to feel like I'll have to watch out for my mom the rest of my life. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more captivating stories. Share your own experiences, opinions in the comments below, and let's keep the conversation going. Until next time, stay tuned for more epic tales.